folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. I, I got a smile on my face. Usually before I start recording these Watchmen broadcasts, I spend uh, a little time in prayer and I, I spend time musing, uh, which means thinking and pondering and meditating on something. Um, I spend a little time thinking about what I'm going to say, how I'm going to start things, and so on. And um, the Lord brought this to me. Of course, now we're dealing with the number. This is the King James Code, and we're dealing with the number 33. We started that last week, and uh, if you have not seen it yet, I encourage you to go watch it. Uh, that, that will bring you up to speed on where we are. We are going to kind of go back a little bit. Uh, it, in where we ended up last week. But I want to go to, it, it, it came to my mind that there were 66 books in the Bible. Now, this is easy math. That's 33 plus 33, or 33 times 2, okay? And when I think of the Word of God, I think of, Two things. Number one, my Bible, which is the Word of God. And number two, I think of the one who has the name, the Word of God, which of course is Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible always um, reiterates or re-emphasizes this point that Jesus comes to the earth twice. He's already done it once, and when he came to the earth the first time, he was born where? In Bethlehem, which was, keep this in mind, we're going to see this a little bit, the city of David. But let's go back now. He was born in Bethlehem. Where was it prophesied that he was to be born in Bethlehem? The 33rd book of the Bible. Okay, which is, talks about Christ's first coming and his second coming. So in the 33rd book of the Bible, Ma Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose, and I like this, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting, because the, we believe the Bible teaches us that Christ always was in everlasting past, He is, and He always will be everlasting future, okay? Now, that's how we understand the realm outside of time. It's everlasting and there is no beginning, there's no end, which we cannot comprehend, but that's how it is, all right? But then keep reading. <clears throat> so this is the 33rd book of the Bible, and this is where the wise men, think about it, the number 33 deals with sight and wisdom and knowledge and so on. And so he was born in Bethlehem, prophesied in the 33rd book of the Bible, the wise men, told King Herod that's where it says he's going to be born in Micah, Bethlehem, Ephrata. Then the next verse of that chapter, chapter 5, Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Well, lo and behold, I think that that is a reference to the second 33rd book of the Bible. In other words, if we go from Genesis to Micah, that's 33 books. If we go then from uh, Micah, comes after Micah. Anyway, starting with Micah and going forward, we have another 33 books, which takes us to the 66th book of the Bible. And remember, that place in Micah, oh, i got to find it again. Oh, Amos, Jonah, Micah, here we go. Uh, it says, therefore he will give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth in the remnant 
of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. So we have Micah, we have Nahum, which is starting the new set of 33 books. So Nahum to Revelation, 33 books. She which is travailing brings forth is Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, the, the, uh, the great, red, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads, and so on. In verse 5, it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That's like a perfect match to the prophecy given in the 33rd book of the Bible. So you have Christ being born in Bethlehem, and he's going to be the ruler in Israel. Here it prophesies that Christ uh, is born and he's going to be ruler in Israel of the entire world. He's going to rule the whole world with a rod of iron. She's travailing in birth here, 33rd book of the Bible, 33 more books in Revelation. Here this woman is travailing in birth, and she gives birth to the man-child. Welcome to the Watchman video broadcast. I'm Pastor Mike, okay? So let me put this up on the screen for you. This sort of gives us this, uh, the starting point. So we can launch forward because what I've got for you today, I actually got brand new, something brand new to show you. Never saw it before until yesterday. And I just had this big smile on my face. So here we go. Remember that the word sight is mentioned 333 times in the King James Bible. The 33rd occurrence of the word sight is Exodus 33. Verse 13, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee and that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. And of course, that's Exodus 33. That's a 33rd occurrence of the word sight. Um, and remember, the 33rd word that the serpent spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden was eyes. And it referred to then shall your eyes be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Take a look at these. Remember these graphics from last week. We have the third eye being opened, uh, and that represents, when you see the people from India, and they have this dot, it's actually called a spot. The word is in, in Hindu is bindi, or bindu. And it literally means a spot. Now, think about it. These people are spotted. What is the church of the living God supposed to be? Unspotted. Think about it. Because they are connected. There's no doubt in my mind they're connected. It all has to do with awakening this pineal gland in your mind that when it's activated, literally it puts you to sleep. But they call that an awakening. Often you will see images of the Buddha with this blissful look on his face and his eyes shut. That indicates, and I guess they're just not aware of this, God won't let them see it, but it indicates that Buddha is asleep. He's actually dead. He's not alive right now. He's not. He's dead and so that everybody that follows the Buddha, they believe that they're going to have the same uh, ecstasy about them and that their eyes will be opened, but it's going to be just the opposite of that. It's going to be shut. And then remember, the 33rd, uh, the 33rd level of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry um, given to us in symbol by way of the double-headed eagle, which Manly Hall said, basically every eagle that you see is going to be a phoenix of some kind, okay? So the phoenix bird, it's down in the flames. Think about it, hell. It's down in the flames, 
It's going to rise up out of the flames, out of the ashes of its own demise, and it's going to rise up again and become God once again. And you notice that there are stars under the wings. There are exactly 32 stars, the eagle being the 33rd, because he's wearing a crown, and he also has the, um, you know, I just noticed this, the cross above it. Mm. Just notice that. And, of course, the triangle with the number 33. And if you want to read some Masonic information to find out exactly what the number 33 represents, good luck. Because you're probably not going to find it. I've read Morals and Dogma. I've read uh, Manley Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. I have dozens and dozens and dozens of books on Freemasonry, on secret societies. I've watched I don't know how many videos. None of them get it right. The Bible is the only source that we can get understanding of what this number is all about. And I I'm, think of who we talked about last week, who was born in Bethlehem, prophesied in the 33rd book, seen in Exodus 33 as God showing Moses his spine, his back parts, 33 bones in the spine. Um, the one who was baptized on his, uh, uh, when he was 30 years old went through three Passover feasts. Now he's 33, 33 and a half. How long does the Antichrist reign? 42 months, three and a half years, exactly. And from the time that Christ was baptized to the day he was crucified, three and a half years, exactly. Okay? One is a mockery of the other. It, it would be like all of these fake Bibles being a mockery of this King James. Or it would be like this book, Morals and Dogma, which on the front of it clearly says, for Scottish Rite use only, to, re to be returned upon death of whatever. The widow was supposed to turn in all of her husband's Masonic regalia, his lambskin apron, and the copy of Morals and Dogma that she wouldn't understand if she read it. They're to turn that back in. And, that's, and because the words that are in there are secretive, they're not to be read out in the open. Mortal, common man is not supposed to know what's in that book. Well, I read it. It cost me 20 bucks at a used bookstore. I read it. And what I didn't find was their secret. I found their secret in the book that I'd had all along. Amen. So that's where we're headed this morning, all right? Then remember, uh, and I mentioned this already, God showing Moses his back parts in Exodus 33. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. In verse 23, thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And remember, there's 33 bones in the spine. So God is showing Moses a foreshadowing of the one whose number is 33. And that would be Jesus Christ. So all through the Old Testament, you have all of these appearances of Christ, sometimes in multiple ways on the same page. Like when they brought a, a lamb to the high priest. Well, Christ is the high priest, but he's also the lamb. Uh, he's, the, he's the priest that offers up the sacrifice, but he's also the sacrifice for sins. Okay? So uh, whether it's a lamb whether it's a rock, whether it's a building, uh, whether it's the Ark of the Covenant, whether it's the Ark of Noah, or whether it's the 33 bones of the spine, all of them point you to Jesus Christ. And remember, the middle chapter uh, of the Bible, Psalm 1, look there, turn right to it, Psalm 117, um, 1189 book, chapters in the Bible, all together, you divide it in half, You've got an odd number there, and so the middle chapter, Psalm 117, and it has exactly 33 words in it, in the King James. 
Go count them. If you, if you don't believe me, go count them by hand. Or get the software, purebiblesearch.com, download it. We don't get any money from that. Download it. Use it. You'll love it. I promise you, you'll love it. Now, take a look at this. Kundalini. Again, it's not a, it's not a Italian spaghetti dish. Um, it is probably one of the most dangerous things to get involved with. If you've heard me say over the years, don't use a Ouija board. What I mean by that is, don't use a Ouija board, ever. Don't, don't have one in your house. I'm working on something related to that, okay? Um, do these things carry with them evil spirits? Pretty sure they do. Um, but anyway, don't have a Ouija board in your house. And then... You've ever heard me say, don't practice yoga. What I mean by that is, don't practice yoga. Don't do it. Don't even practice, quote unquote, Christian yoga. Well, we go to the Y, and the Y does yoga classes, and really it's all about stretching. And listen, if you want to stretch, get up in the morning, bend over a few times, and stretch all you want to. Okay? I have found with my lower back problems that when I stop and I stretch, I look kind of funny in a store because I'm bent over almost in half, but I'm stretching all of those muscles in my lower back and I feel much better when I stand up straight. I'm, ah, that feels good. Stretch all you want to. Don't practice yoga. Remember, the word means yoke. And the Apostle Paul told us to not be yoked together with unbelievers. Don't participate in their religious training because that's exactly what it is. You know, every false religion has its own gospel, their way of getting in close with God. With those who are of the Hindu religion, their way of getting in contact with God is through yoga. They believe that you will achieve this point where you, you will be enlightened. Remember, you'll get a bendy, a spot. You're supposed to be unspotted. You're going to get a spot in your forehead, and that's going to show enlightenment, and you're going to be yoked now with Brahma, the chief of all gods in the Hindu religion. And it's not Jehovah. It's not Jesus Christ. There, is, there can be no such thing as Christian yoga. That would be like saying, uh, we, per we participate in Christian adultery. That's what we do. It's adultery, but it's Christian-centered. It's Christ-centered. That's what we do. That's so it makes it right. No, it doesn't. So anyway, Kundalini, you have this serpent, the base of your spine. Remember, the, the bottom three vertebra do not have any nerve bundles coming out of them. They have no contact with heaven, with the head. Remember that? So the serpent wants to climb up, and he doesn't just go in a straight line. He goes in a crooked line. Remember that. Goes in a crooked line, up the 33 bones of the spine, up through the seven chakras, which if you look on this graphic here, you'll see these circles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. The chakras are called energy vortexes which are like the wheels in Ezekiel chapter 1, they're devils, they're spirits. You're activating seven devils. You're inviting them in to take over your body. Do you remember what significance Mary Magdalene played in the story of the Gospels? Was she the harlot that washed Jesus' feet? The Bible says nothing about that. The Bible only says that she went on the first day of the week to uh, anoint Jesus' body um, after his death on the cross. How did Mary Magdalene come to know Christ? He delivered her from seven devils. Those seven devils, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what they are in a little bit. I've got notes on it. You'll see it. I'll show you what those seven devils are. Now remember, this is getting from, from last week, 
we're moving ahead today. I'm not going to read all of this, but the secret of Kundalini, I believe, is that you have the devil, he's the serpent, always, down at the base of your spine, which represents hell, and he wants to ascend up, Okay, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. He's going to go through the seven chakras and activate seven devils in a person's life. When he gets to heaven, which is the head, that's the most high place of your body. There's no, nothing higher than your head. And so when he gets there, he activates you, and you now become you have the insight of the gods. And he says, I will be like the most high. So that's the, that's the, I think, the real purpose behind Kundalini is him going back and forth. I keep doing this for a reason, okay? I'm not having fun here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Remember, this was actually captured on film. The actual uh, initiation of someone receiving full-blown kundalini. They didn't have to practice it. They didn't have to get ready for it. It just happened. This serpent, this is an actual photograph, people, from Stephen Greer's, one of his groups. They're meditating out there. They're calling in what they believe are the extraterrestrial visitors. What they are actually is devils, and there's one of them right there. And Greer says that this person, that that serpent spirit went through, actually went, uh, received a kundalini spirit in them. They had a kundalini experience. So it goes up their spine, goes right to their forehead. You can look at the picture there. Activates them. Now they have what they believe is a, a superior awareness or a higher vibrational state. I haven't figured that one out yet. I know it has something to do with a person's ability to believe in the spirit realm and to see into the spirit realm. Okay, I'm working on it. But anyway, that's what they believe will happen. So now, one of the things that has really caught my attention with this number 33 is how it shows up in marketing, how it shows up in religious activities, how it shows up in politics, how it shows up in history, events that take place. I'm going to use this later on, but I'm going to give you an example right now. Remember the miners down in Chile that got trapped? How many were there? 33. And remember that symbol Manly Hall showed us of the double-headed eagle that he said, it's not really an eagle, it's a phoenix rising up out of the ashes, the heart of the earth. Those 33 miners were rescued by a specially built capsule that they, they drilled and drilled and drilled, finally got it down to where they could pull the guys up. It was called the Phoenix. The Phoenix saved the 33. Okay, Now, you can't make that happen. No power on earth has the ability to cause a mountain to lose its lunch that way and drop the heart of itself down in uh, where those miners were and trap them in there the way no man can do that. There were spirits that were doing that. 33 rescued, and I'll show you, there's, there's more stuff on that. We'll get to it later. So with that in mind, seeing that these things, they're all around us, this idea of the 33. Remember, we have Christ, we have Antichrist. And I will just tell you that 99.9999 times out of 100, that's all 33, by the way, 33 divided by, or times three. 
99.999 times out of 100, it's going to be pointing towards something related to the Antichrist. Here's an example. I showed this last week, okay? And this is what led me to find out something. It was right there in front of me all along, and I never really picked up on it until yesterday. But remember, Elon Musk is sending these rockets up. Okay, he's going to get into the space business. He already is. And so he's developed this new rocket called the Raptor. A Raptor, you know, from Jurassic Park, is a dinosaur, which would be a dragon, a reptile, okay? A serpent, that, that's what it would be. But it's a dragon. And the dragon, the Raptor engine has exactly 33 rockets that at sometimes they're all lit up, sometimes only half of them are lit up, but think about it. Here you have a dragon, a serpent, 33 engines to do what? To lift it up off of this earth, push it up into the heavens to be up in the heaven. It will eventually be taking man up into heaven. The 33 engines will take men up. Think about it. It's, it's everybody else's gospel except the true gospel. The true gospel says, forget about going into space. Man, I want to take you all the way into the third heaven where God lives. Amen. What do I have to do for that? Nothing. Just be born again. Jesus did all the work. He forgives all the sins. The work was Christ. The, the work has been finished. It's all done. You just believe that Christ died for you, that he is Lord, and that he rose again from the dead. You believe those things. Confess them with your mouth. That's what saved people do. Amen? So that's our gospel. But everybody else's gospel is like from Genesis 11, which we'll get to, Genesis 11, which basically says we're going to build us a city and a tower. You know what these rockets are? Towers. They're towers. Let's build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make a name for ourselves. So 33 rockets take the dragon up into space, eventually taking mankind up into space. And I'm just like, why did, why did the designers of this put 33 engines in there? Couldn't it get by with 32? Could it, could it use 35? I'm sure it could. But why exactly 33? I think there is a spirit at work. I don't think a secret council got together and they wrote out plans on how they can get 33 things out in, in, the, in the limelight, make, make things happen of 33. I don't think that happened at all. I think just as we are led and guided by the Spirit of God through the Word of God, these people are guided and led by the serpent himself. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, calls him the prince of the power of what? The air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So, ponder this for a minute. 33 rockets taking man up into space. Okay? Have we been up in space before? Well, if you're a flat earther, you just might as well shut the rest of this off because all I'm going to do is make you mad. But yes, we've been up to space many times. But what was our greatest achievement so far in space? What was our greatest number one thing that mankind, a giant leap, what did we do? We went to the moon and came back. Now, I've had this information. I want you to take a look at this. I've had this information in front of me for several years. I made this, I made this graphic. I did the research on it, but it, it, it never occurred to me. They started out with Apollo 1. Apollo 1 was supposed to be 
the first flight of the Saturn V rocket. Three of our nation's best pilots there uh, in the Apollo capsule. And basically they were just going to take off, go around the earth a few times, test out some of the things that they had, maybe do a spacewalk, come back down. The devil likes a sacrifice. He does. And again, I never, I never thought about this until yesterday. Apollo 1 never happened. The three astronauts that were in there, Gus Grissom and two others, I can't remember their names, Roger Chaffee was the second one. But anyway, three guys in there, and they were doing a test. They were in, they were in their full gear, helmets on, everything. They were locked inside the capsule. They were having problems communicating with... Um, NASA control and Gus Grissom remarked at one point and he said if we can't even talk between buildings how can you expect us to communicate from the moon back all the way to earth the cabin was filled with pure oxygen at some point something shorted out and sparked and with all that pure oxygen in there it literally burnt those guys to death. They have recordings of them screaming and they couldn't get the door open. That almost did away with the whole Apollo project right there. But the devil loves a sacrifice, a burnt offering. So Apollo 1 never flew. The crew burned in a pre-launch fire. No no Apollo 2 and no Apollo 3. I don't know why. Nobody knows why. Apollo 4, 5, and 6 were unmanned test flights. They sent the Saturn V rocket up with all the, 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 the Apollo capsule on there and everything that they were going to need in space. They sent them up there three times to test it out. Then, beginning in Apollo 7, three astronauts up in space. Apollo 8, three astronauts up in space. Apollo 9, three astronauts up in space. Uh, Apollo 10 actually sent uh, guys to the moon. They orbited the moon several times. And you had this famous picture, first time it had ever really been seen by man is the Earth rising up from the, from the lunar horizon. Beautiful, beautiful picture, okay? Before Photoshop. Anyway, they circle the moon, they test everything out, then they fly back to the Earth. And then you have Apollo 11. So you have Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins making that, I mean, absolute historic thing. You have to remember something. Mankind had only been flying for 60 years. That's it. Since Wilbur and Orville Wright started flying their, their paper mache airplane, mankind has only been flying for 60 years. And we flew all the way to a precise, nearly precise spot on the lunar surface, land there, walk around, spent the night there twice, got back up, took off, met up with uh, the uh, Gemini capsule again, and orbited the Earth, the moon, and then boom, headed for Earth landed out in the middle of the ocean exactly where they were supposed to. Without a doubt, the greatest human achievement. But here's the thing. Apollo 10, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 11 manned flights with 
each one of those having three astronauts on board, how many astronauts did you have in the Apollo mission? 33 exactly. Bump, bump, bump. And why Apollo? Apollo was the god of prophecy. Remember, knowledge, understanding, seeing things. He was the god of prophecy. They, he also was the god who moved the sun across the sky in his sky chariot. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. So, now... I mentioned marketing. I didn't mention this. I didn't mention movies. Oh, my goodness. The number 33 in movies. Let me just show you one that has to do with sort of what we're talking about. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It was the first movie that my parents ever let me go see by myself. They didn't want to see it because it dealt with Martians, they thought. Okay? But they dropped me off at the LeJade Theater here in Festus, Missouri on Main Street. And for the first time, I got to watch a movie all by myself. And I was just fascinated with it. I have a copy of the movie now. Uh, I have a book that was being sold at Costco several years ago about the making of the movie. So there's a lot about it I know. And I know Steven Spielberg. I know a little bit about him. I know that he's a Jew. And I know that he mocks Christ. In the movie E.T., you have a God who comes down to the earth. Actually, he falls to the earth, so he's not Jesus, but they make him look like Jesus. He is a God. He lives on this earth. He leads all these children like the Pied Piper, and now he's got a, he dies and is resurrected again and then goes up into heaven but before he does that, he touches little Elliot on the forehead. Bing! Right here where the dot is supposed to go. So here in the movie, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, number one, there's a scene at the beginning where uh, some sort of government crew is what you're looking at. You haven't figured it out yet. But some sort of government crew is down in Sonora, Mexico because there was a UFO event that happened overnight. And what happened was, all of a sudden, these old vintage airplanes, looking like they were brand new, show up out here in the middle of the desert. The story is that they went missing from Pensacola back in 1945. So, they show up here, they send this crew down there, this man here at the top is standing by one of the, uh, the uh, airplanes, and notice the number. And he says in this scene, he says, Mr. Lacombe wants the numbers from the engine blocks. And the number that you see here is 33. In fact, it's there twice. You see it right below there in the white area and then right above his cap. Now, directors of movies do this all the time. They place things inside their movies. They're called Easter eggs that have some sort of symbolic meaning either to them or it has something to do with the foreshadowing of the movie. Anyway, fast forward to closer to the end of the movie, you find out that this man, uh, who uh, played by Richard Dreyfus, whose name was uh, Roy Neary, he was one of 12 people. Spielberg did his research well. So Neary, along with these other 12 people, get this download, and they're all supposed to come to a certain place. They don't know where it is. But then they all find out that it's a monument in Wyoming called Devil's Tower. Now, there's a scene in the movie prior to this where one of Neary's kids, the mom says, kids, it's time to go to bed. This kid grabs the TV, turns it around, and he says, but Dad said we could finish watching the Ten Commandments. Now, why that movie? Because it had to do with God selecting 12 tribes, giving them a vision 
to meet with him at the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And Moses is selected out of these to go up into the mountain. Remember what mountains represent in the Bible? They represent heaven. Okay? So, Neri and the, these other people are drawn to Devil's Tower. Twelve people drawn, to, it's the opposite. Remember, it's, the, it's not Christ, it's Antichrist. When Neri gets there, he finds that the government's already set up this place where they're going to meet the aliens. So the mothership lands, opens up, all these people start coming out. These are people that have been abducted over the years and they're, they're bringing them back to the earth. And these little aliens, white aliens with the big eyes, Spielberg knew about this before it became popular generally what these creatures look like. Small, slender bodies, big heads. So he had, there in Mobile, Alabama, where most of this was filmed, he hired a local company that taught girls how to dance. He hired them to bring in girls, six or seven years old, that would fit in these little costumes and act like the little alien. So there they are there. You see them in this picture here. And what's Neri doing here? This, out of all the people, they selected him to go up. Remember? Out of the 12, he gets picked. When they ask Neri what his birthday is, he said it's something 1941. The movie takes place and actually came out now Neary in the movie is 33 years old. And he gets taken up into the ship to live in the stars. Mm -mm -mm. So, now let's get back to this, this winding snake, okay? In Hindu religion, it's called Kundalini. In the Hebrew religion, which is the religion of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the religion of the giants, that God told them not to learn, but they learned it. And they grafted it in to their worship of Jehovah, is what they did. And God said, I'm a jealous God. I'll not have any other gods before me. I'm not going to let you do that. And I'm not going to let you get away with it. But that's what they did. And that's what they've been doing for the past 3,000 years. They're still practicing it, by the way, because basically Jewish religion, as it stands right now, is the tree of life, the Sephiroth, Kabbalah. That's what it is. And so in the tree of life, notice that you have opposites. You have two poles here. One has a negative sign at the top. One has a positive sign at the top. The positive one is, is lit up white. The negative one is lit up a grayish color, supposed to be dark. And notice that it consists of 22 crooked serpentine paths that connect to 10 divine circles. Now, there is an 11th circle that is hidden until the paths end at the kether or the crown at the top, just like where the kundalini serpent goes to. That hidden circle is called daleth or knowledge, like, a, like a, an occult knowledge, like you know something now superior to what everybody else knows. And of course, when you add the 22 paths to the 11 circles, you get 33. Okay? Now, let me break this down. The 22 paths, well, that's easy. That is... The 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, you can find those in Psalm 119. They also, now that we know this, they are representative of the 22 amino acids that make up the genetic words of the book of life. In other words, it represents DNA. So think about it. The 22 paths look, are to represent our DNA. And the 22 paths 
go like this, and how does DNA look when it's all folded up and closed? Like two serpents going like that, okay? Then you have the ten, what's, what Manley Hall calls the divine circles. He got it right. He got that part right. They represent the ten kings or the ten horns or the ten toes. In Revelation 17, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Daniel 2, and as the toes of the feet, and there's ten toes, were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. Just like on these two poles here, one's positive, one's negative, you have opposites in the ten toes. They're partly strong, partly broken. They're part of iron, part of clay. They are opposites to one another, and they try to mingle them together, but they, it doesn't work, and it won't work. And then the Bible reveals to us that those ten circles trying to mingle themselves with the 22 lines, the 22 paths, the 22 Hebrew letters, the 22 amino acids, they are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what the tree of life represents, people. But it won't work because you can't mingle iron with clay. Then you have seven levels on this tree of life. There at the top, where the kether is, where the head is, that's your first level. Then where the second and third circles are, that's your second level. Now remember, the hidden one is not really there right now. It's hidden. So you go down to number four and five, that's a level. That's the third level. Level six, just below that. Level seven and eight level nine, and then level where the number 10 is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And remember what the seven chakras were. They were seven devils. Mary Magdalene had seven devils cast out of her. I, I just think that she had something similar to either the Kabbalah or uh, Kundalini or maybe a combination of both that she practiced where she had seven devils in her, okay? So these seven levels are seven chakras, seven devils. This, they are the opposite of the seven spirits of God. This is from Isaiah 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now look at verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That's your seven spirits right there. That also is 33 words exactly that I have underlined here. Now, folks, ponder that just for a minute, okay? Here we have the verse that describes exactly what the seven spirits are. We know that Christ has those seven spirits. He is Christ. He and the Spirit are one together. Okay? He's 33 years old when he dies on the cross and rises again from the dead. And there are 33 words exactly in one translation of the Bible that describe those seven spirits of God. And it's an accident, right? It's not there on purpose. Or could it be? That's my challenge to you. Could it be? Now, I know you, you may come up with all kinds of reasons why you think it can't be. Well, we know that no translation is inspired. Do we really know that? What part of the Bible did you read that from? What, what scripture indicated to you that the words of God 
would fall into decay and corrupt. In fact, what do we call this book? Even in, pastors, even in your preaching, what do you call this book? You call it the Bible. You also call it the Word of God, don't you? And so I'm just going to ask you a simple question. Will you, from this point forward, stop referring to this book as the Word of God because of your belief that this book cannot be right in everything that it says. It is wrong in things that it says. Because you know the Word of God is powerful and quick, meaning it's alive. It's not dead, it's alive. And you know this book gives life. And you know that the Word of God cannot be wrong. So, will you be honorable enough to stop referring to your Bible as the Word of God because of your belief that the Word of God is actually perfect, but you believe that the Bible is not? Or will you just keep maintaining the status quo and repeating what you believe to be a lie. The Word of God is right. It's always right. The Word of God. Now, I believe there are mistakes in the translation. You can't have it both ways. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, just very quickly, I want you to notice that uh, back in this verse, he, uh, Isaiah 11, verse 1, that this stem, this root is coming out of Jesse. What was Jesse's son's name? Okay, think about it. Hold on to that. We'll get to it in a minute. All of this, the kundalini or the sephiroth, the tree of life, the serpent on a pole, the serpent on our spine, which is a pole, the serpent on the tree of life, all of it represented by what's in Numbers 21. When the Jews decided they didn't want the bread anymore, they didn't want the, the meat of the Word of God, they didn't want this old stale, stagnant, old King James Bible stuff. We want new stuff. So Moses went to God with it, and God says, I'm going to take care of that. And so these fiery serpents come out. These are not regular snakes. They are spirit beings. They're devils. Just like what we saw with uh, the, the picture of the kundalini serpent. Those serpents went and bit those people. They poisoned them, not just physically, but spiritually. And they're all going to die the first and the second death. And they cry out to Moses, Moses, Go to God, tell him we're sorry, Moses. So we pick it up in verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You know what you're seeing here? You're seeing the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ before it ever happened. These people were told to look upon that serpent and if they just did that one thing, they would live. If they had been bitten, God would take the poison away. But that's all they had to do. Now, they didn't have to recite 30 prayers 50 Hail Marys, 35 uh, Our Fathers. They didn't have to do any of that. They didn't have to flagellate themselves, with, scourge themselves on the back. They didn't have to do that. They didn't have to give large sums of money for masses to be said so they can be forgiven. 
They just had to, they didn't even have to find the snake to put it on the pole. Moses did that. All they had to do was look on it and live. Now, if anybody said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, God's not like that. God wants us to work for our salvation. Bunch of idiots, you fools. God wants us to earn our salvation, to prove that we're worthy of it. All he said was look and live. And what did, what did Jesus come along then and say after that? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That serpent was Christ taking on the power of death on himself and killing it when he died. That's what Colossians says, that he made a show of his enemies openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in the cross, making a show of them openly, so that when Christ died, they died too. Okay? Oh, I love that. So Christ is not saying, I'm Satan. No. He's saying, I'm going to take Satan's power. I'm going to take what those sins are. I'm going to take them all on me. And I'm going to hold on to them. And I'm going to die. And they're going to die with me. And all who will believe in that will have everlasting life. That, my friend, is the simplicity the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -mm -mm. And how old then was Jesus when he took the power of death, hell, took the power of sin that was against us and the handwriting of ordinances that was against us? How old was he when he nailed them to his cross? 33 years old. So here's Herod now. I've been shedding light on this, but here's Herod now. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. So he's born king of the Jews. How long does he live to be king of the Jews? Well, John 19, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Well, lo and behold, there it is again. How many years? 33 years later. That points to Christ. So remember, in Micah chapter 5 is where we found where Jesus was prophesied to be born. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And so, in Matthew chapter 2, here's Herod asking the question, where is he going to be born from? So we pick it up in verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. They didn't, they didn't say this then, but they could have. In the 33rd book, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art, thou, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Oh, I like it. And remember, what is Bethlehem? It's the city of David. In Luke chapter 2, we find that out because uh, the, uh, the August uh, Caesar Augustus causes everyone to be taxed, which means they had to go to the land of their ancestors, camp out there until everybody gets counted. And when they get counted, then they get taxed. So Caesar Augustus taxed the whole world as he knew it back then. And now Mary and Joseph, who are espoused, they make the journey to Bethlehem, the city of David, their father. You see, Mary was of David. Joseph was of David. 
and they met together. They were espoused. It was a legal binding contract. The espousal was, could not be broken except by a bill of divorce, and that's what Joseph was going to do when he found out that people were going to find out that she uh, was going to have a baby, but they knew that they didn't have a, a wedding for them. He was going to put her away privily, and the angel of the Lord told him, don't do that because this is from God, and don't you worry about it. Okay? So, watch this. From Adam to Abraham, you have 20 generations, starting with Adam. Adam's number one. Seth is number two. We know that uh, Enoch is the seventh from Adam. Noah's the tenth from Adam. We, now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez would be 24. He begat Hezron. That's 25. Hezron begat Ram. That's 26. Ram begat Amenadab. That's 27. Amenadab begat Nashon. That's 28. Nashon begat Salmon. That's 29. Salmon begat Boaz, that's 30. Boaz begat Obed, that's 31. Obed begat Jesse, that's 32. Jesse begat David. David is the 33rd from Adam. Doesn't that, doesn't that just bless your heart? It does mine. All, I mean, think about all the prophecies centered around David. In fact, the book of Ezekiel, where um, the, the dry bones uh, come together. Uh, let's see here, where is that? Ezekiel 37, that when the dry bones become to come together and um, God declares that this is the whole house of Israel, that he's got two sticks. One of them is called Judah, the other one is called, oh, let's see, where is it? Uh, verse 19, take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribe of Israel, his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and will make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereon they, they, thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And then it goes down and talks about that there's going to be a king over them, and in verse 24, it says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. Not this David, not the David who is the 33rd from Adam. That David, David, who is the son of David. The Lord said to my Lord, okay? Oh, I love it. I love it. The numbers will always show you what's true. Now, next, next week, or I uh, said so we got homecoming coming up. It's going to be a while. We're going to put some more of this together. I've got tons of information on the number 33 and how it shows up everywhere. Okay? You'll not want to miss these, these teachings. Okay? So I hope today's been a blessing to you. You've been a blessing to me. I promise you that. I thank God for you. I thank you for your prayers, your love, your support for us, for our ministry, for the people of Kenya. Pray for them every day. Pray for their pastors that are ministering to them, uh, that, that God would bless them, that God would give them grace and comfort, and that God would bless all of his faithful ministers who love his word and love his appearing. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.